You guys did a big Great event to today where you talked to, about Moore's Law, but last week I did something with, um, with uh, 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 Craig Barrett, and he, he mocked me, basically. He said, guys like you, Corey, have been saying Moore's Law is dead for 20 years. Uh, it's more than that. The, the speculation is that semiconductors can't get twice as fast and, and a half as expensive uh, every 18 or 24 months, but you guys are still pulling it off. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the, the, the rumors of Moore's Law have been around for a long time, even 25 years ago. Uh, but what we showed today was data that for us, Moore's Law is alive and well. It continues to drive costs down and performance up, and it's the driver of our business, and frankly, it's a big driver of the economy. Uh, it, it certainly has. It's, it's, it's unquestionably changed the world, although it's really not a law of science, right? It's, a, it's just a, essentially a marketing goal uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a scientific research goal, yes? Yeah, I'd say actually Moore's Law is more of an economics law. Uh, what it says is that you can double the number of transistors on a piece of silicon every two years. And what that allows us to do is either improve the capability of products or reduce the cost of those products. And so it was, a, it was an observation by Gordon back in 1965. And then the smart technologists have just been keeping that marching forward uh, you know, for 50 years. So what's the most important, say, two or three innovations that you see uh, in Intel's roadmap that are going to allow this to continue? Yeah, so, so for us, when we look at uh, the complexity of advancing Moore's Law, we're now employing something called hyperscaling. And so what that means is that we're getting bigger improvements generation by generation, and that's allowing us to keep on the track of, of Moore's Law. And there's a lot of technology that underlies that, but it is in essence, you know, it's taking longer to go from node to node, but we're taking much bigger steps, and that gives us the historical benefit that powers our business. What are the chemical processes that are different in your, in your sort of next generation that you're looking forward to? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 as you just said, everything changes uh, uh, in terms of how you do process technology. And so we unveiled a lot today. This was actually the first time we've done an event like this in over a decade, because we're normally pretty secretive about uh, these kinds of things. But we talked about transistor structures. We talked about uh, some of the process steps that we use to give us exquisite control that allows us to do double patterning in the factories. Um, and so we, we went through a lot of technology disclosures. I think for the non-technologists in the room, it might have been a little bit uh, too much, but it, but it really showed where we're heading and it allowed us to align the industry around some key technologies because we need their support to continue Moore's Law as we go forward. All right, well, geek me out on one. Just tell me one that really got you jazzed when, when it first sort of uh, found actually applicable uh, uh, science that you can put to work. Yeah, so, so one of the key things that we talked about today is uh, something where it's a, it's a uh, multi-die interconnect bridge. And so EMIB so in, is what we call it for short, which is a very catchy name. And what this allows us to do, it gives us a very high speed interconnect so that we can take products from different process technologies or even products from different companies, put them together into one package and create entirely new classes of products. And, and that's so not a singular chip, is that a singular chip? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's multiple dyes that can come from different places. Okay. But you put them together with a very high-speed interconnect, and that allows us what, what we call it as heterogeneous mix, mixing and matching of capabilities. And so we can pull like a modem from one generation of technology, graphics from another, a CPU from another, put them together into a very high-performance uh, uh, package and create a cadence of innovation that is different from what we've ever been able to do before. And so these are sort of like uh, the dyes sort of stacked on top of each other like, a, like record albums in, a, in, a, in, a, in one of those machines in a diner or whatever? In this case, they'll actually be next to each other. Yeah. So you do very small dye, you put them next to each other with this very fast speed interconnect. Uh, it's really wild stuff. It's, 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 yeah. it's sort of amazing because one does understand why it's hard to believe that it can continue to get so much faster and that this law uh, can continue to, to perform itself. But it's a great challenge that Intel seems to meet every, you know, every, every few years. But I think what's also interesting, though, is that the, the way chips are used is, are different now and that the drivers that Intel once controlled, where, where it was data centers and PCs, are not as, as maybe uh, relevant in a, in a mobile world and an Internet of Things world. Is, is that fair to say? I mean, you still need it on the back end with a data center, certainly, but maybe not sensors in a, in a stoplight or in a car. So, so the interesting thing is, is that leadership process technology, which is what we talked about today, is applicable, obviously, in the high end of the market. So think of it in machine learning and artificial intelligence in the data center. It's applicable in the high end of the client market. But it's also really important as you start thinking about making devices smaller and more energy efficient. And so, so actually, I think leading edge process technology is more applicable today 
uh, than it ever has been. You just use it in different ways. Uh, one of the slides I showed today is that the high-end portion of the foundry market, uh, the leading edge portion of the foundry market, has been growing at a 14% CAGR over the last 10 years. Uh, and that's really being driven by you know, mobile chips that are going into high-end phones and Internet of Things applications. That's really interesting. So, and so you're seeing that across across the board uh, at the high end, because it doesn't it doesn't necessarily translate when you when you sort of see these companies all all slung together and, and all the kinds of things they're doing. Yeah. So no, we're seeing we're seeing more and more of the overall silicon that's being produced in the world is going towards the high end, and it's again because people want performance and they want energy efficiency, and uh, being at the leading edge enables both of those things.